Okay, well, it's a new day, and um, today I want to continue um, talking about Marx's work, and I want to get a little bit into his analysis of capitalism and class society today, just give you a kind of an overview of it, um, so you get the gist of what he was saying. Uh, last time we defined the mode of production, and we uh, also then talked about different examples of historical modes of production. We said something about primitive communism, about the ancient slave mode of production, about feudalism. And I wanted to uh, specifically talk about uh, capitalism, because after all, that's, that's where Marx was leading. Marx was leading to a uh, analysis, uh, critical analysis of capitalism. <clears throat> so uh, just by way of review, I think the first thing we could say is that, well, capitalism is a mode of production. We called it a mode of production. And that when Marx describes a mode of production, he's talking about uh, the basically the style or the uh, specific kind of organization of economic activity, right, within a, within a society. Um, and then we said that that mode of production is made up of or consists of these three uh, dimensions, right? We had the means of production, uh, which are the tools and utensils and other kinds of resources that are used to carry out production. We talked about the forces of production, which is really referring to I think what we would call technology, and then we have the relations of production, which are all the different uh, social arrangements that human beings create, right, around this uh, this process of production. Okay, so that might include the division of labor, but it would also certainly include uh, the class system. When we get into these surplus producing modes of production, we would have to then also talk about uh, the class system. Uh, about whether or not, uh, you know, uh, people own or don't own the means of production. Do they control or do they not control uh, the means of production? And certainly that control of means of production is going to be defended by other kinds of uh, cultural arrangements. Remember we talked about the base superstructure relationship. So uh, every mode of production is going to also produce its mode of political organization, and that, that, that mode of political organization is going to be shaped by the imperatives of the mode of production. So capitalism, for example, is going to produce its own kind of state uh, with its own uh, legal arrangements and so forth, and laws, et cetera, that protect the interests of private property and so on. Okay, that's just a little bit of an example. But it's also going to give shape to a kind of a kinship system. It's going to give rise to different kinds of ideologies um, that explain or rationalize the, uh, uh, the system as it stands uh, and so on. So these are maybe some things we can mention a little bit later on. Um, what makes capitalism, well, first of all, you know, we should maybe define capitalism, right, and then talk about how it's a little bit different from those other modes of production that came before it, right, especially feudalism and uh, uh, ancient society, slave society. So the first thing I guess we would say is, well, capitalism is uh, a mode of production based on private ownership of the means of production, right? And that's not necessarily anything different. Uh, other modes of production are based on exclusive ownership, private ownership of means of production as well. Uh, under feudalism, the land was held privately by, by families, right, of uh, that landlord class. Uh, in Rome, you had an aristocracy that owned land and owned wealth and so on. So private ownership is not really anything new. Um, uh, uh, both of those systems, you know, feudalism and ancient society are based on private ownership of the means of production, 
right? Private ownership of wealth producing property um, uh, as, uh, again, as private property, okay? Defended by a legal uh, system of legal arrangements and so forth. The difference between capitalism and those other um, systems has to do with the fact that capitalism is a market society. And this, this uh, private property, the means of production held privately by capitalists, uh, is, is a little bit different than it was in those past uh, modes of production. Like we said, capitalism is a market-based society. For Marx, one of the things that capitalism does is it universalizes the what we're going to call the commodity form. Okay, it universalizes the commodity form. Uh, and when we talk about the commodity form, we're really talking about things that have to do with market relations, right? So, in other words, when I say that capitalism universalizes the commodity form, what that means is that now we're moving toward a society, where we're moving into a society where um, everything is uh, for sale, right? Everything is for sale. Everything at least is potentially for sale, okay? So, uh, you know, we get these markets, all right? So capitalism has a commodity market, right? All kinds of commodities, things that are produced for the specific purpose of buying and selling. Um, you know, like um, all the stuff on your store shelves, right? Those are commodities, right? They're, they're people, those are produced for the purpose of, of them being bought and sold. Uh, so, uh, commod so that kind of commodity, consumer commodities, right? Um, but other things as well. So capitalism also, uh, you know, has a has a market for money, right? It buys and sells money, right? We call that the credit market, right? Um, uh, or capitalism uh, also. Well, here's one thing that makes capitalism different than those other two modes of production that came before it, and that is that there's a market for capital, right? Capital is wealth producing profit, profit generating property, right? Is for sale. Uh, and it is sellable and buyable, for example, on the stock market, right? And that's if you think about the stock market that way, that's what's happening is that units of ownership are being bought and sold, right? Uh, on, on the stock market. And capitalism also creates a labor market, right? Uh, and, uh, you know, just like any other uh, market, right, just like any other commodity, in other words, I'm saying labor gets commodified, right, under capitalism. It's bought and sold on the labor market, right, and it's bought and sold for a wage. So the way we understand the wage, right? So the capitalism is a system of production based on wage labor, the exploitation of labor through wage labor. And the way we understand the wage is that it is the price of labor, right? And just like any other commodity, it's subjected to the laws of supply and demand. So <clears throat> the more uh, if we have a surplus of labor, if we have um, a lot of workers out there looking for jobs and, and, and the opportunities for jobs is maybe limited, that means the price of labor is going to go down, right? If we have a scarcity of labor with too many jobs that have to get filled, that means the price of labor is going to go up, okay? Just like anything else, um, the price of labor is dictated or regulated by the relationship between supply and demand, okay? Um, now that means though for capitalists, right, that uh, uh, they want to try to extract as much labor out of their workers as they can and pay them the least, right? They wanna pay them the lowest possible cost, uh, the lowest possible cost that they can get away with, right? And so the economic interest of the capitalist is to pay the worker as little as possible, okay? Uh, if we think about this in a kind of an extreme way and think about maybe 19th century England, like the way, you know, 
where Marx was living when he was writing Das Kapital, is um, even to keep workers in a condition of impoverishment, you know, paying them just enough to kind of keep them alive and to keep them productive, uh, reproducing their ability to come back to the factory every day, but not much beyond that, okay? Um, everybody good? So the capitalist has in, the, in, his, in his or her interest uh, paying workers as little as possible and workers have in their interest uh, uh, to end the conditions under which they are exploited. And we're going to talk about you know, the conditions under which they are exploited uh, in a few minutes. Now, the other thing I guess I would say here is when I say labor is a commodity, you know, technically what Marx talked about is that it's not labor so much that, that was a commodity. Labor power is a commodity. Right. Labor power is a commodity. Labor power to Marx is your ability to work, right? whatever ability that is. So that can include, you know, your physical ability to work. You know, right. But it could also include different kinds of skills right? that you have and knowledge that you have. All that stuff is your labor power. OK. And you need a job. And so you, what you are doing when you're looking for a job is you're putting your labor power on the market and you're asking somebody to buy it, okay? Now, ideally, you're going to want to sell that labor to the highest bidder. But we're going to have to talk about different things that are going to influence that, the, the price of that labor. So, you know, first of all, we said that, that labor, the price of labor is, is uh, governed by the relationship between supply and demand. Right. So one of the things Marx says, and since since um, uh, capitalists have in their interest, right, uh, paying as little as possible, right, for their for their uh, labor, for their labor power, buying it as, at the lowest price possible, then unemployment becomes a permanent feature of capitalism. Right. Labor that goes unused, unutilized. Uh, in what Marx called the reserve army of labor. So the larger this reserve army of labor, uh, the, the lower right, the price of labor is. Why? Well, because the more workers there are and the fewer jobs there are, uh, that means that workers are going to be competing with each other right, for, for these jobs. And as they're competing with each other, the, uh, they're going to be, if you think about it kind of like bidding, right? they're going to um, price themselves lower, okay? They're going to accept, right? Workers will accept lower wages when there's a great deal of competition, right, for jobs. So, so capital wants to encourage that competition. And it, it does that by uh, maintaining a, a what Marx called the reserve army of labor. Um, and, uh, and so the, the more intense that competition is between workers, uh, you know, the more of a downward pressure that has on, uh, on, on labor, right, and the lower, lower the wages. Now, the other thing here is uh, think about it like this. If I have skills, if I am a craftsman and I have extraordinary skills at, let's say, how to build something, right, like building furniture, uh, I'm a craftsman, and I have this craft knowledge that's been passed down from generation to generation, and you, and you need me, right, to produce your good for you, then that's going to mean that I can uh, command, right, a higher price for my, for my labor, right? But if I'm a capitalist, what's going to be in my interest is going to be to cheapen the labor of my workers, right? So... I want their skill not to matter, okay? Uh, and the way I do that is by simplifying the process of production through technology, like introducing the assembly line, right? And introducing machinery into the productive process. So now I don't, I don't really need you anymore, right? Because the skill to make something now has been placed within the machines, right? and the assembly line. So I can really get anybody off the street, right? I can get anybody, and in a very short space of time, I can have them 
uh, you know, working uh, in my factory. Okay, so uh, that's been called. There was a, a economist named Harry Braverman, right, back during the uh, middle of the 20th century, who talked about de-skilling. So Marx, Marx recognized that too. <clears throat> Marx recognized that. And well, maybe we'll say a little something about that, where Marx talked about how capitalism is always after the <clears throat> improvement, right, of the uh, uh, forces of production, right? Um, uh, uh, and what he was really talking about was de-skilling, excuse me. <clears throat> what he was really talking about was de-skilling. So the less skill uh, involved in the production of anything, that means, the again, I'm replaceable, just like on an assembly line. You know, we make standardized parts and we can have replaceable interchangeable parts, interchangeable uh, components. Um, mechanization uh, also makes labor replaceable. I can replace you with anybody, right? And when I can replace you with anybody, that means that you are now in competition with, ev with all other workers. And so that's going to drive the price of your labor down. Think about today, right? American workers are in competition with workers uh, from all over the world because these processes of production have become so uh, over-mechanized and over-simplified. Okay. Everybody, everybody got that so far? Uh, so... We have capitalists, we have workers uh, in a capitalist society, the reserve army of labor. We understand uh, uh, the price of labor is the wage, okay? Um, and I think what I want to do <clears throat> is stop right here, and then when we come back, we're going to talk about wage labor, okay, as a... As a uh, a, a system of the, the exploitation of labor, according to Marx. Remember in the previous segment, I said that the secret to class, the way that class works, is how do I get you to work for me and not for yourself? How do I get you to produce my wealth, right? Um, and in capitalism, that's going to be accomplished through the wage labor system. Just like under slavery, it was it was accomplished through uh, it was accomplished through coercion, right? The coercion of slaves. And under capitalism, it's going to be accomplished through the wage labor system. Okay, and we're going to need to talk about how that's so. All right, so I'm going to take a little break here, right? And uh, let you think about stuff, and then we're going to come back and, and we're going to continue. Okay, so see you in a little bit. <clears throat> 